All right, let's begin. Good afternoon. I'm Councilman Mark Jonai, Chair of the Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our, to our hearing on Small Business Services Management of the Business Improvement District Program. Bids, or business improvement districts, are a crucial component of New York's economy. There are specific areas established in the law which property owners agree to pay a tax assessment in order to fund programs and services to make their district more attractive to consumers. There are currently 75 bids citywide serving more than 93,000 businesses, maintaining more than 127 public spaces, collecting more than 4 million trash bags, and investing more than 148 million each year into our local economy. Last year, they accounted for 474 million in sales tax revenue, or 28% of all sales tax revenue in the city. 6.6 .6 billion of property tax revenue, or 25% of all property tax revenue that the city collected. Total sales in bids have nearly doubled, growing from 5 billion in 2010 to 9.6 billion in 2017. Additionally, there are two more bids, the Throgs Neck bid and the Allerton Avenue bid that are being finalized that will be become in total 77 bids citywide. Small Business Services, or SBS, is involved in all stages of bids establishment and responsible for their management and oversight. This hearing will focus on the ways in which SBS cooperates with bids to ensure that they all have the resources necessary to make our commercial corridors an attractive option for shoppers. Issues related to public safety and sanitation are of particular importance to the business owners I've talked to, and they feel that bids spend too much of their budget on basic city services, such as sanitation and public safety. They further elaborate that business is struggling to keep their doors open due to competition, increased real estate taxes, water and sewer rates, regulation, hefty fines for minor infractions such as the outdated signage law that many businesses are not in compliance with and subject them to a $5,000 fine. They can't understand why their bid fees are being used to provide for services they already are paying the city for in taxes and not for events, marketing, and beautification programs that would improve their businesses. Small businesses are under attack from all sides, and sometimes the pressure comes from those who are supposed to help. Business-killing policies such as clear curbs and road dieting can do as much damage to a mom-and-pop shop as competition and rent burden. In addition to all of the aforementioned burdens, competition from big box stores and changes in consumer behavior, such as online shopping, make it very difficult for small businesses to succeed in New York. In fact, 50% of businesses do not make it to year five. And a recent shocking report indicated that there is a 20% commercial vacancy in Manhattan. Make no mistake, our brick and mortar businesses are at a crossroad. And bids may be the solution to protecting our commercial corridors from becoming desolate burdens and blights on our neighborhoods. And probably equally as important is if we lose the tax revenue that our businesses pay, that burden will be shifted onto New Yorkers to additional taxes. This is why it is absolutely imperative, per, mm, imperative we do all that we can to help create a business-friendly environment Every single business owner I've spoken to has expressed support for their bid and the crucial role it plays. More customers for mom and pop shops means more sales, more sales means more revenue, more revenue means more profit, and more profit means businesses expand and provide more employment opportunities for New Yorkers. When our businesses succeed, our tax base expands, and we are then able to provide even more services for our communities. It is in our best interest to ensure that bids can thrive, and I'm excited to learn more about the dynamics of bid performance from bid leadership and discuss the important issues with my colleagues from the SBS. I'd like to thank the Small Business Committee staff 
as well as my Chief of Staff, Reggie Johnson, and my Legislative Director, Darden Janbali, for the work in making this hearing possible. Finally, I'd like to recognize the committee members that will be joining us that aren't here now. Thank you. I'd like to announce our first panel, uh, which is Small Business Services, and I believe Blaze, formerly known as the Mayor of Myrtle Avenue, is joining us. Um, and Blaze, I believe you served as a bid director for 10 years for Myrtle Avenue, correct? So I'm looking forward to not only hearing your testimony on SBS, but also the experience and the knowledge that you bring with you and how you've helped SBS refocus its limited resources on improving the bids. Thank you. So please write, raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. We can begin. Good afternoon. Chair Jonai and the members of the Committee of Small Business will be joining soon, I'm sure. My name is Michael Blaze Backer, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Neighborhood Development at the New York City Department of Small Business Services, or SBS. I'm joined today by Roxanne Early, Director of the New York City Business Improvement District Program. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today, we'll be providing Council with an overview of the City's Business Improvement District program and the vital roles bids play in commercial districts across the City. I've broken down my testimony in five key buckets. One, the core relationship between SBS and the City's bid network and how bids work. Two, SBS's oversight and program support to bids. Three, the bid formation and legislative processes. Four, our capacity building and organizational development support. And five, our efforts at interagency coordination. After my testimony, testimony, we are happy to take your questions. SBS oversees the largest network of bids in the country, with 75 bids delivering more than 147 million in supplementary services in commercial districts that are home to approximately 93,000 businesses throughout the five boroughs. We are proud that this administration has continued to support the formation of more neighborhood retail-based bids located in outer boroughs, giving business communities across the city an opportunity to pool their resources for supplementary services and raise their collective voice when working to troubleshoot issues with city agencies. We recent, recently celebrated the creation of the city's 75th bid, the Morris Park bid in the Bronx, located in Chargonai's district. We're also proud that this administration has continued to demonstrate its support for the bid network by doubling the size of the staff dedicated to supporting and overseeing the city's bids. The core of SBS's relationship to bids is rooted in partnership. The expertise of local, on-the-ground partners is essential to tackling the unique challenges faced by New York City's diverse neighborhoods and business communities. Bids provide essential services and are most effective when they can work closely with city agencies, particularly those that are providing direct services in their communities. Bids work hard to develop and maintain relationships with city agencies at the most local level, those with whom they can interact with frequently to troubleshoot immediate concerns, and city agencies work hard to be responsive. But as the network of bids grows, the bid model itself continues to evolve, and as the city works to tackle increasingly complex challenges, efforts to coordinate between bids and city agencies has also grown increasingly complex. SBS is aware of these challenges and is working closely with both the bid association and multiple city agencies to improve communication and coordination. Bids represent a geographical area where local stakeholders have agreed to assess themselves above and beyond their real estate taxes to fund and oversee the maintenance, improvement, and promotion of their commercial district. Bids are a public-private partnership with two integral components. The first is the district itself, described by the district plan and composed of the specific geographic area where individual tax slots contribute to an assessment. The second is the District Management Association, or the DMA a not-for-profit entity composed of a board of directors of at least 13 members, of which nine must be local stakeholders within the district, the other four being elected officials. The district plan includes the precise geographic boundaries, assessment formula, and a description of supplemental services that the bid is able and expect expected to perform, and it is enshrined in local law upon bid formation. The District Management Association is governed by its bylaws, a contract with SBS, and the New York State nonprofit law. Together, these entities form what we commonly refer to as a bid. 
The programs, activities, and support the bids provide to their business communities are locally tailored to the needs of their district, determined by their locally controlled board of directors, and are supplementary to the district services provided by the, to the district by city agencies. Services provided can generally be altered as determined by the organization's board as long as it continues to comply with its district plan and its contract with SBS. Most often, bids provide supplementary sanitation, public safety, marketing, and streetscape services. But services provided by bids go beyond the city's standard services. Those bids whose boards have determined that supplementary sanitation services are required tend to offer some combination of daily sidewalk sweeping, lining quarter litter baskets and placing the bag litter for DSNY collection, power washing and gum removal from sidewalks, removal of graffiti, and the removal of snow and ice from corners. These are responsibilities that would usually be expected of individual merchants to keep their districts clean and attractive. But by pooling resources from the district, bids work to lift these burdens from local merchants and create a more welcoming and vibrant commercial district. We believe that bids are strong local part partners in commercial revitalization and a powerful voice for their members on an individual and aggregate level. The hyper-local nature of bids allows for a tailored approach to services that directly address the needs of individual neighborhoods. Since bids are locally governed, each individual board of directors determines the priorities and programs of their bid. In the 1970s, that pr priority was typically to make districts clean and safe. As the needs of commercial quarters have shifted, many bids have taken on additional programs that address quality of life issues and the managing and programming of new public spaces. This adaptability and nimbleness in addressing specific community needs is one of the greatest strengths of bids. As the scope of bid services evolves, we intend to continue partnering with bids and creating the necessary feedback loop to inform and improve city services. Each bid board of directors is made up of property owners, commercial tenants, residential tenants, and representatives of the mayor, borough president, comptroller, and city council member. The elected officials are voting board members of bid boards with the same fiduciary responsibilities as any other class of member on the board. Many bids also have a community board member as a non-voting member. SBS staff represent the mayor on all bid boards, serving as full voting members of the board of directors. Bids are funded by a special assessment on the properties in their boundaries. Bid law states that each property must pay in proportion to the benefit they receive from bid services. Therefore, each bid uses a unique assessment formula to reflect the realities of its own built environment. Each bid reinvests the assessment back into their districts in the form of supplemental services. Assessment dollars can only be spent on services that benefit the entire district. These services are outlined in the district plan for each bid, which is drafted when the bid is formed and dictates what services they can and will provide. Since SBS serves as the primary oversight agency of bids, we ensure that these assessment dollars, which are being paid by the individual property owners and business stakeholders in each district, are being spent responsibly and in compliance with the law. To do that, it is incumbent upon SBS to provide monitoring and oversight without creating an undue administrative burden or micromanaging the local programmatic decisions of each bid that allow them to be highly responsive to local needs. This oversight includes monitoring the fiscal and organizational health of all 75 bids, managing each bid's contract with the City of New York, monitoring for contractual compliance, and ensuring assessment billing review and delivery for all bids. SB SBS believes that a strong organizational foundation will set each bid up to successfully deliver great local programs and services. We focus our oversight on three categories, good governance, contract adherence, and transparent operations. Good governance is essential to having a highly effective and well-functioning bid. Given that bids are locally governed, their board should be representative and their operations must reflect the bid board's strategic direction. As voting members of the board, at boards, SBS can be more hands-on in the governance of the board to ensure bids are adhering to their bylaws and procurement requirements and making decisions with robust input from the board. Our, our bid team also manages the contracts that each bid has with the city. We monitor that bid contracts are up to date and that organizations are following the provisions of the contract. They sum must submit audited financial statements, an operating budget, and a year-end annual report to SBS each year. We use this data to help measure the organization's financial health. We also work to ensure that bids are transparent and accessible to their stakeholders in multiple ways. For example, by having an office in their community for stakeholders to meet with bid staff, as well as by deploying appropriate tools for feedback through surveys and outreach, including during the legally required annual meeting when members of the bids have the opportunity to elect the board of directors and steer the direction of the organization. When an organization is at risk in one or more of these categories or falls below our minimum expectations, we work directly with our partners to address these issues. It is in our collective interest to facilitate improvements across these areas 
So SBS offers targeted support to bid executive directors and boards and has developed a suite of capacity building programs to help organizations meet our expectations. From leadership development to individualized coaching services focused on board recruitment, fundraising, digital marketing tools, and annual meeting execution, we aim to help all bid partners succeed. I will expand further on this when I speak more about our capacity building efforts. Beyond our support for existing organizations, we are also very involved in the efforts by communities to form a new bid. When a community is interested and ready to form a bid, SBS assists in the multi-year formation process. Bids in New York City are formed through a community-driven process that starts with the active engagement of property owners, business owners, residents, and other local stakeholders, and ends with legislation passed by City Council. SBS is currently working with upward of 20 communities throughout the five boroughs that are in various stages of the bid planning process. When local stakeholders approach SBS about bid formation, our first step is to work with the group to evaluate the feasibility of a bid in the proposed area and the capacity of the stakeholders. If the group determines that a bid is not the best course to pursue at the time, then SBS can provide guidance and resources for alternative commercial revitalization and neighborhood development options. For commercial quarters involved in bid formation, SBS serves as a resource for the steering committee, which is the group of local stakeholders that leads the formation effort and decides on the details of the plan for the proposed bid. Each steering committee receives the support of one or more SBS project managers. SBS expects steering committees to have representation from all stakeholder groups, including property owners and commercial and residential tenants, and to involve them in outreach throughout the entire process of bid formation. SBS works closely to guide these groups into planning, outreach, legislative, and startup phases of the bid formation process to ensure that it proceeds fairly and properly. SBS will only introduce proposed bids into the legislative phase of the process if we believe that the steering committee has followed the planning process correctly, solicited community input, and has demonstrated broad-based support across all stakeholder groups of property owners and tenants. Other legislative processes that SBS helps to guide forward are for bid expansions, assessment increases, or district plan amendments. If a bid wants to change anything about their district plan, they must also receive legislative approval from City Council. There are three primary ways that bids change by modifying their boundaries, increasing their total assessment, or changing their district plan. An existing bid may want to expand, uh, that may want to expand to include additional properties, especially if their neighborhood has developed and changed over time, or if they want to extend the reach of their services. Additionally, each year, about 10 to 12 bids select to increase their bid's total assessment. SBS reviews these decisions, requesting detailed justification for the increase and line-by-line -line budget, ex budget explanations, and introduces legislation to allow these bids to increase their total assessment. If a bid wishes to change the formula they use to assess their district properties or change with services they are expected and allowed to provide, they need to amend their district plan. SBS helps bid staff and boards through these processes and helps to get legislation introduced. In addition to providing oversight of bids, their governance and legislative processes, and the services required by their district plans. SBS also provides several types of technical assistance, grant opportunities, and capacity building services to bids, as well as other community-based development organizations serving the city's commercial districts. We especially strive to support small budget bids and bids in low to moderate income neighborhoods. For example, every year, SBS works with the Coral New York Leadership Center to run the Neighborhood Leadership Program, a nine-month-long cohort-based program for nonprofit leaders in economic development and place management organizations. About 20 individuals participate every year, and we are just completing our eighth year of the program. Almost 100 bid directors and staff have participated in this program since its inception in 2011. We also provide legal assistance to bids to ensure their governance structure and legal policies and procedures are up to date and pr to protect each organization. 17 bids have worked with pro bono lawyers to update their organization's governing documents. SBS, SBS also offers about 12 to 15 nonprofit management workshops on such topics as board governance, financial management, project management, and marketing, with all bid directors are invited to attend. Two years ago, we began offering one-on-one -on -one coaching via the Support Center for Nonprofit Management, and have found this to be especially useful for new bid leaders in building a strong organizational foundation or helping an executive director to overcome a particularly vexing management challenge they are facing. 13 bids have worked with coaches over just the past two years. Overall, 45 out of 75 bids participated in our capacity building programs last year. In addition to these capacity building programs open to bids and other nonprofits, our bid team is always supporting the network through bid specific assistance. Every month, we send out our bid bulletin, an electronic newsletter of which you have some copies in your packet, to the entire bid network, sharing important resources and information from SBS and other agencies. 
The bid bulletin provides information directed specifically toward bid staff from SBS and other city agencies, as well as information directed toward bids member businesses and property owners, which can then be copied and inserted into bids own newsletters for wider distribution. We also maintain a library of document templates which bids can use, including sample bylaws, internal policies, and annual meeting materials. To help bids facing leadership changes, SBS introduced a new onboarding process, so whenever a new bid executive director is hired, we provide a thorough orientation focused on compliance and resources available through SBS. One resource that we provide to the entire bid network and beyond is our annual bid trends report. You have a copy in your packet as well. The report aggregates program and expense data from all bids in New York City. It demonstrates the impact that bids make in their neighborhoods and highlights innovative programs that bids have taken on, spreading best practices throughout the network. Bids can also use this report to help them budget and compare their expenses to peer organizations. This summer, SBS staff met with nearly every bid executive director to discuss challenges and helpful resources. We held nine separate listening sessions across the five boroughs and will be holding one more session at the end of this month. These meetings were an opportunity for bids to discuss the issues they face today, and we heard that issues involving the coordination with city agencies were front and center. Bids are on the front lines of the challenges the city is confronting, and we as a city can enhance our ability to confront these challenges and to deliver locally responsive services by working with the bid network to create a real-time feedback loop. They have invaluable local knowledge and understanding of complex issues from the ground level. Our goal is to improve communication between the bids, SBS, and other city agencies. This is a work in progress, but a role that we take seriously for our bid partners. Over the last few years, we've made progress in developing better processes for how other agencies communi communicate with bids. For example, we su successfully worked with the Mayor's Office of Citywide Event Coordination and Management to grant bids access to the city's online event management system. An important first step toward better coordination with these essential city partners who not only proactively program our streets and public spaces with community events, but also clean up after them, liaise with NYPD and other city agencies, and communicate regularly with impacted businesses and residents. We'd be interested in collaborating with other city agencies to replicate this model, working to create a more seamless mechanism for information sharing and operationalizing service delivery with local feedback and on-the-ground intelligence from bids. For many years, our staff have convened borough roundtables with local New York City police department precincts, allowing bids to discuss and improve coordination with NYPD. And for the last several years, we have worked closely with the Bid Association to interface with the Department of Design and Construction to streamline the process for notifying and involving bids in city-initiated capital improvement projects that might impact local merchants, property owners, and residents. Currently, we're in active conversations with the Department of Transportation and the Law Department to address the Bid Association's concerns regarding the concession agreements in place for the city's pedestrian plazas. And we have just announced two more efforts with the Bid Association and Public Policy Lab to address local challenges that bids have raised. One, the work with, to work with the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities to address ADA compliance for storefront businesses, and two, to work with DOT to enhance outreach, coordination, and data sharing when rolling out new transportation policies in commercial districts. This kind of good partnership starts with SBS, of course, where we have worked collaboratively with bids to improve on their contracts with our agency, as well as solicited, solicited their direct feedback on the way we collect data from them and deliver on our suite of support programs and oversight responsibilities. These are all significant undertakings, and we look forward to getting started on more ideas for improvements. We'd like to thank our bid partners for their continued collaboration on behalf of our neighborhoods and small businesses, as well as our sister agencies and council for their continued work on these, with these integral community partners. While the role of bids has evolved over the years, the fundamental structure of the model makes bids unique from other nonprofit organizations that contract with the city. Because one, bids are governed by locally controlled boards of directors elected by their membership. Two, bids use their non-city tax levy assessment dollars to provide highly customized and adaptable supplemental services, all of which do not replace city services and all designed to meet locally identified needs. And three, bids have a unique relationship with city government. They were created by local law, operate under a, re a renewing contract with SBS, and have four government and elected officials with voting seats on each board. The opportunities for close collaboration between bids and the city in both the delivery of local services and as a feedback loop for local challenges is considerable. We look forward to ongoing conversations between the City Council, our sister agencies, and our bid partners to continuously refine existing processes and channels of communication, and we will continue our efforts to more fully realize and leverage the bid network as a meaningful, real-time feedback loop for the City. Thank you. I want to thank you for that. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we have Councilmember Rivera, who just joined us. 
and I'm sure we'll have others. It's a hectic day with many committee hearings. That was an uh, impressive and lengthy explanation of the services SBS office. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I understand that the SBS has gone on a listening tour of bids citywide in order to help improve the quality of services that SBS delivers. Can you please share with us some of the most common concerns and any alarming issues that you may have heard of? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, <coughs> and yes, um, we have, um, as I touched on, we certainly have um, an opportunity here from bids all the time, and we certainly always intend to leverage our board representatives um, to get feedback at all times. But we did engage on this opportunity um, to talk more uh, with the bids about challenges they were hearing um, about SBS service delivery, so certain um, programs. We wanted to hear about what they knew about, what they were using, what they were referring um, to their members. We wanted to hear about interagency uh, challenges with interagency coordination, um, as well as um, feedback on, on some of our efforts at oversight. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll defer to um, Roxanne on some of the details, but I think we do, con we do frequently hear, again, about what I touched on a little in my testimony is the aspect of not all agencies sort of being aware of the bids or being uh, aware of sort of their capacity to be collaborative partners in their neighborhoods and, and therefore um, how can SBS continue to play a role there to either elevate their concerns, connect them to the appropriate, um, appropriate people within these agencies at times, um, um, which is sometimes half the challenge is just finding the right person who can uh, can assist our bids. Um, and then I think there was, of course, several. Um, um, we didn't we didn't really focus on district, you know, district by district challenges um, per se. But it was little. It was a more about bids interaction with SBS and the city as a whole. Um, so, um, anything else you want to touch on? It's interesting that you brought up organizations or agencies, I'm sorry, and departments that may not have had the relationship with bids and the importance of that relationship. What have you done to correct that problem besides identifying an individual at an agency? Uh, and have you resolved the problems for that bid? And I would imagine maybe you can give us a list of those agencies. Um, well, I can give you a few examples if that would be helpful. I think um, in some cases, so I maybe just to s separate two, two different things, I think there's issues that arise that are sort of, let's say, more urgent in nature for a very individual bid and around a very specific challenge. And in those cases, it is my, it is my hope that those bids elevate that concern to either Roxanne or myself. And in those cases, we work to elevate those appropriately with our executive office and, and to either you know, an, uh, the right person within another agency. I think the more common situation lately is really the work that the bid association has taken on with us where a number of bids are having a similar challenge and therefore the bid association sort of in order to elevate that challenge and actually figure out how to address it they form have formed working groups we assign a staff person from our team to that working group so we can work collaboratively to address the challenge and actually um, you know Seek, seek to look where we can make adjustments and we do make sure that we find the right people within city government and that agency to work with us through the challenge. Well, what are some examples of those agencies? Sure. Um, well, so I touched, so again, the one um, that we have, I mean, I, mean, I touched on the mayor's and uh, the citywide office of event coordination and management. So that was one, I, it's back a few years when we did this because that was one when I came into this role uh, was one that was talked about frequently where for example, right, street closures happen for events. Some of those events are bid events, but a lot of events are not bid events. It could be, uh, be filming for, right, MOPD um, filming. It could be another event. And so it was often happening is that the, that the bids did not know when a street was being closed, and therefore they couldn't notify businesses. They couldn't plan, the businesses couldn't plan ahead for deliveries, so be it, right? So, um, and also there was an opportunity for bids to actually potentially chime in on an event before it was permitted. So, because a bid might know what's going on or should know what's going on in their community that might uh, inevitably contradict with a planned event by a third party. So, in that case, we work very closely with the mayor's office um, um, and we essentially got bids, their own 
specific login to the system that allowed them to see when events were being planned. Um, and they actually were given sort of the authority um, to comment, similar to the way a community board might, when an event is being planned, so they can actually provide some input into whether um, they foresee any challenges. Um, again, I don't, th some bids I think, again, have a lot more events being permitted in their districts than others, but for those bids, I think, where that was a particular challenge, we were able to get that uh, in place, and it's one we continue to refine. <coughs> That's a great example. <coughs> but you know, you're missing on a more important one, I believe, that is impact bids, and that is DDC projects, such as water mains and sewers, and construction, because events are typically one day or short-lived, and construction projects that can impact the services such as water to entire commercial corridors that with improper notice, with no advance notice and notices in error of water shut off, for example, on a date, uh, which the water is not shut off, and then the next day or the following day, there is a turn off. Is that what you're referring to, Pat? That's, a, that's another good example. I didn't, I didn't list all of them. <laughs> but yes, that is another example, one I'm intimately familiar with. Um, and I've, uh, we have been participating for quite some time um, with the Department of Design and Construction, um, several borough presidents, City Hall, and others to, to tackle that issue. Um, it's, it's a real one. We're, we're well aware of it, where capital construction in commercial districts can negatively, severely negatively impact um, small businesses um, in, that, in the area, whether it's notification for water shutoffs or whether it's rerouting of buses. I mean, it could be m multiple things, and some of those construction projects um, can take quite some time. So um, we have been working for, uh, it for some time, I, I don't actually remember, probably at least a year, um, with uh, DDC to work on a stronger um, communication process that they are very much you know, working in collaboration with us so that bids are notified um, <coughs> not only during sort of the planning <coughs> of a capital construction process, so you know, perhaps it's the phasing of the project, perhaps it's when, you know, when design, uh, when projects are bid out and construction is going to start, so making sure that bids have a seat at the table, particularly um, when the bid is going to be the ultimate maintenance partner of a public space, which is where I think a lot of this issue has come up. Um, and so we've been working closely. It's, it's, it's not an easy fix. Capital construction, I think, is inevitably um, going to negatively impact in the short term uh, many of the businesses that are operating. And so we, we are work doing our best to like, help facilitate that conversation to ensure a, a better process, better communication coordination is in place. Which I understand, and uh, all things begin with small steps, but have you put in place any concrete steps that they must follow before they turn off services such as water, electric, uh, or um, street closures and sidewalk closures that businesses cannot prepare for in advance? Well, is that, sorry, was that a question? Uh, well, you, oh. you say that you created the dialogue um, to better the communications between the projects and those corridors. Yeah. Has there been anything put in place that prohibits a contractor uh, from turning off water to an entire district without proper notification? What is proper notification? Right. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I can't speak in detail to DDC's process, but my understanding is that DDC does have actually, there is advanced notification already required for water shutouts. I think the challenge arises is when that advanced notification is set, it's given, plans change, businesses plan ahead, they close when they think the water is going to be out, and then it doesn't get shut off because things change in the field or with the contractors, and perhaps that information then does not get communicated. And that is what we are trying to tackle. So I, my understanding is that procedures are in place, but the communication channels that need to get to the bid and therefore their stakeholders are not in place as well as they could be, and that's what we are working on. I should also touch on and I, um, that we have been working since this started. We, we started, we have been communicating better with DDC, and therefore we, they have a quarterly meeting of their CCLs, which are their construction community liaisons, we have now, SBS and some of the bids, in fact, from the Bid Association have attended some of those quarterly meetings to elevate, um, to kind of educate and teach the CCLs a little bit more about the bids and where to ensure that communication is happening more um, 
it's just happening in a way that is more effective, but also we're trying, as SBS, trying to ensure those CCLs have a better understanding of the resources SBS offers so that they can, if they are interacting with the business, they can connect to them uh, where possible. Those construction projects, who are they supposed to provide notice to? The, uh, I, I mean, my understanding, and I, I think is all residents and businesses in the impacted area. I don't know what the full catchment area is. Currently, they are not required to report or have dialogue with bids. I am um, required in like an administrative code. I don't believe so. Provide but that's them notice. Typically, they provide notice to a community board. Correct. And perhaps, perhaps they may give notice to businesses. And that is not definitive. And the bids do not have a seat at the table or a part of the conversation at all. So that is, I, I, I think I completely agree with what you're saying. And that is the inherent challenge for a lot of what we are trying to do with the bids and the bid association. The bids are not part of the city's charter. They are not inherently triggered to be notified in the same way a community board is. And therefore, it is sometimes people are following procedure, they notify the community board, some very active, higher capacity community boards tell bids and, and that information gets dispersed. So what we have been doing, and that's why I gave the CCM example, where we actually did get bids sort of, again, I don't wanna say the equivalent of a community board, but they were given a certain treatment to be able to log in and be given essentially a, a login that really no other nonprofit organization had to be able to get that sort of access. So not only do they get a daily email every time there is an event being planned, so I think something similar is sort of the concept, and we, we sort of tackled events because we had a willing partner and, and, we, and we tried that and we're continuing to, to tweak that, um, but I think that is important. It is what we'd like to see and what we're trying, we're working with DDC to come up with a, a solution that builds, that inherently builds bids into the notification process. And I'd like to be a part of those conversations and actually have the stakeholders at the table when those di discussions begin on setting up real protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any other example of agencies that you c or departments that you can give us examples of with that have been brought to your attention and not very cooperative or uh, have been good partners with our bids? That have been? Have not. Or have not. <laughs> from the complaints. Um, I think, what I, if, if I may, I think I would, well, I mean, what I would say is usually when an issue is brought to our attention, um, where, a city, where a bid is having a real challenge, I think there is always willingness on, city, on the city agency's part to, to interact with, both at the local level and also sort of at more senior management levels of the agency. It really is, in many cases, it's just about like honing in on what the actual problem is, and in many cases, ensuring that there's um, perhaps a shift if necessary. And so, you know, just as an example, and I, I know you cited it, and what you said, we, you know, we all know there's a lot of, um, of work happening in the, in, um, with Department of Transportation around innovative um, transportation ideas. And so we have, res you know, we were successful in getting um, DOT to the table and they've been very anxious to work with us so that we can going forward learn from, from some of them, the recent instances where bids were not as in the loop, perhaps, as they should have been when, when policies were rolled out in their districts. So we now have them, and I, I touched on it in my testimony, to work on how we could, similarly to what we're doing with DDC, work on a policy where we're essentially integrating bids into a process, and not, and not only just a process, but actually as a thought partner, and at times sharing data and, and outreach strategies so that there is a better way um, for bids to be informed before a policy is fully baked and before it is rolled out and actually have an opportunity to either push back on a, process, a policy or perhaps help their members buy into a policy, whatever it may be. Yeah. I too have met with almost all of the bids. We've invited them in, chambers, merchants associations to hear um, their needs. And in many of the cases, we've cross-referenced policing, sanitation, including the homeless crisis, the drug epidemics, uh, and the lack of response from the NYPD for many of the bids to be cooperative partners. If we understand the importance of bids and the commercial corridors that they fight for, that relationship doesn't currently exist equally with all bids. 
Some bids have better relationships with their local law enforcement than others. But for the most part, they've all been baffled by the homeless crisis that has plagued many of their corridors. And they have been un unable to address that growing problem, including the craziness when a mattress is left on a sidewalk and three different departments and agencies have to come together and collaborate with whether or not that belong is a person's home. You cannot remove it or discard it without three agencies coming together and deciding yes, that this is not private property or resembles someone's home on a commercial corridor. You elaborate a little bit on this. I, I mean, I can share with you that we we have also heard that concern. That certainly was raised with us, and I think um, I think it's it's it, we're well aware. We are hearing about several quality of life challenges that bids are facing um, across the city, and I think you're right that in some cases, some bids have um, either you know longer standing relationships with city agencies or just you know and and therefore coordinate more and perhaps have had more success than others so we, we acknowledge that, that that's an issue and it, and it is among many that we hope to work more closely with the bid association on and with our city agency partners to tackle so it's not that it hasn't been heard of we just haven't figured out how to deal with it um, I think that's fair to say it's one that we're working on but I, I mean I can't speak to each I'm not obviously an expert in each of those specific subject matters, but I think we, it's, I mean, it's, it's again, we, we, we as, as bids, we see bids as such a close partner, and since they're on the ground, we believe that those challenges are real. We need to help them elevate their challenge and solve them. But I think, as I touched on the, to their credit, bids are um, involved in more and more aspects of sort of our city's uh, you know the management of our spaces, and therefore they're confronting and 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 wanting to get involved in so finding solutions to challenges that I don't think they always were. And so I think in that sense, they're pu they're pushing harder on city government, um, pushing on all of us to do better and to find solutions to problems. And I and, and we're wanting to listen to them, and we're wanting to help them solve those solutions. So hearing from a small business owner, a mom and pop shop, and his frustration with a homeless scenario and approach the NYPD, approach the bid, uh, and continued to reach out to all elected officials to find out that no one could help him is the example that resonates with me. Mm -hmm. The business owner was devastated by a homeless man that blocked the entrance to his establishment and refused to leave and we were not able to get rid of, and apparently there was mental illness involved, but he knew enough, this individual, they could extort money from the business owner. The business owner had to resort to paying him off to leave. If that is not a complete failure of the checks and balances that we have in our system and an undermining of bids and uh, elected offices and the NYPD, I don't know what is. I, I hear the point. I had not heard that story at all. Um, I would hope those types of situations do get elevated to me so that I can at least do what I can to help. I mean, that is, you know, what that's would a you really unfortunate situation. Well, I can, I can say I actually have recently did, uh, I had a bid reach out to me a few months ago about a, a, a homeless challenge in an encampment um, at a, a phone booth that was no longer being used and was going to get replaced um, with one of the Link NYCs. And... I brought it to my, I, I did not have a lot of, I don't have a lot of personal relationships at DHS at the time, I, but I elevated it to my executive office, our chief of staff. I was connected with the uh, Department of Homeless Services chief of staff. I talked to him several times. He connected me with the right people, and, and, and it ended up that when it got to it, the field team at DHS and the service provider for DHS was working quite closely with the bid already, and they and they and you know there were certain things they could and could not do. It ended up it was a do it challenge because it's a phone booth and they could not move it because of scaffolding. I mean, right? So every single issue is going to have 
a lot of twists and turns, but ultimately, I got do it involved. I got the contractor for the Link NYC involved, um, and ultimately accelerated the removal of the phone booth so that the Link NYC, which will be installed eventually when scaffolding down. So at least to, to and this was you know a, a place where it was admittedly, and and the bid was saying was impacting a local business. So you know all I can do is what I can do when when these issues are elevated to me, and literally take each and every one to try to problem solve and, and help. I spent the whole summer battling an encampment of 10 homeless men that took over White Plains Road and Pelham Parkway, where there was a bid, the White Plains Road bid, and we could not remove them from the corner, although they openly smoked K2, drank in public, relieved themselves on that commercial store corridor, aggressive pan participated in aggressive panhandling, took over an entire sidewalk where no one can walk by, they had to walk around and through to navigate around 10 men. DHS, Catholic Charities, Bronx Works, they all participated and knew about these 10 men. The NYPD in my own presence approached them and the response from one of the homeless men was, do you want me to call my attorney before you address me or after I address you? That's what our businesses are going through in our bids. You, we talk about some of the things that we are, that we have no control over and how we'd like to make things better. Clear curbs, which was an, an initiative by this administration. SBS was not brought into or made a part of that conversation. And the impact that would have on our commercial corridors and it impacted two bids in particular. Six months pilot that drove several businesses out of business. And these are things that we could control or should have had a seat at the table and be heard of. Our businesses and our bids are being undermined by the very same people that are supposed to be there to help. And I'm not blaming SBS for the lack of putting the time and the energy into it. But when the SBS can't facilitate or have a conversation with the administration on the impact that it has on the very people that you're overseeing, how do we expect you to have an influence on the NYPD or New York City Sanitation or DHS or any other city services? Well, I, I would, I would perhaps um, elaborate a little on the on the clear curb example because uh, I mean I think it's fair to say that for many of us um, it was not rolled out perfectly. But that being said, once we did become aware of it, which was before it was rolled out in most case, most cases we got the information, we did distribute that to the bids, and then we we knowing there would be concerns and hearing the concerns loud and clear. We did have the, um, the executive office of, of DOT come to SBS and we invited all the bids and we, and we began that dialogue. And within, within days and weeks, we had the borough offices of the DOT's walk, uh, DOT walking, the corridors with, with the bid partners. So point taken, but that being said, when, like, when we were pulled into it, we acted on it. And in some cases, obviously, policies um, were changed um, based on the pilot. I think, as I touched on the testimony, um, I think DOT and SBS intend to work much more closely together so that those types of, when those types of policies are being considered, that we, if they're gonna be happening in commercial districts, that SBS has uh, an opportunity to inform our partners and to solicit feedback earlier. Um, so, you know, our, our hope is, I, I think that's a real and genuine intent uh, to do better. Uh, and I think when it comes to other agencies, I. I think if a situation is elevated to our attention and, and we can put our effort towards it, I think we would get a similar response from other agencies. Guys, I just want to point. The pilot program ended six months later, and it was after numerous media hits, meetings with DOT commissioners and stakeholders and pressure that was put on the administration. We could have gotten ahead of this before it was implemented, and on paper, things may look good but until you implement them, you may not realize the impact. There are literally dozens of businesses that are closed today because someone had a bright idea 
And there are two bids in particular that have been undermined because of that bright idea. The very people that were supposed to be fighting for those small businesses, including the relationship that they had with the SBS, could not make a difference. And that's when we're in our own home, our own house. I, I don't, I don't want to see if uh, Councilwoman Rivera has a question. You're welcome. Likewise. <laughs> Um, thanks. That's a good question, and I think it is one that we, you know, certainly have been monitoring. And um, you know, as you you may see in the, our bid trends report, I mean, the you know bids do provide us with with data on sort of their vacancy, or, you know, the number of storefronts they have and the number of occupied storefronts. We get that data once a year. It is self-reported by the bids, but that is you know a, a, a reasonable. Um, oh, I heard you. <laughs> Um, it is a, a data point we have, and, and at this point in time, and I don't, I don't want to minimize the issue, I think on last year's trend report it was, I think, about 7% vacancy. So, so it is um, unique to the district. Some districts are having uh, a bigger vacancy challenge than others. Um, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think on this, on the, I think throughout um, the existence of bids and throughout, um, and much of neighborhood development, our divisions work, um, has been in, in areas that in the past have suffered from a lot of disinvestment. And so we have historically, particularly with our federal community, um, community development block grants, you know, and it's targeted sort of vacant storefronts and retail mix and how to, how to sort of bring that about. So we, in many cases, we are working with bids, um, especially those in LMI, LMI neighborhoods to actually address uh, vacancy issues through a, a, like a, a, a genuine business attraction strategy um, where we're actually, they're actually sort of looking at the current state of their district, what services they need, and sort of proactively working with the broker community, property owners, and others to attract new entrepreneurs and new tenants to a district to help fill those, those gaps. I think when there are sort of shuttered, and I think you mentioned, I mean, if it's a truly sort of dilapidated or shuttered storefront, um, we, you know, we do have a, a, a storefront improvement manual, so we have attempted to connect bids to sort of best practices around how to encourage and incentivize uh, property owners um, to kind of make enhancements or to tenants to make enhancements to a, to a physical space. So I think on a policy level, I know very recently the, the, the Bid Association did um, create a working group um, to, to sort of start looking into this issue a little um, more closely. So um, we will, again, be working with them on that so we can uh, make sure that we're leveraging the bids, sort of, again, local intelligence to ensure that we are kind of, as SBS develops strategies and other programs to address this issue, we're sort of being mindful of what, what they're seeing on the ground and ideas they may have. Okay, you know, so the bids, they receive uh, the fees, I, I guess they're called fees from their businesses, and, and each district or neighborhood is very, very unique, and, and some are clearly, you know, poorer than other areas, like the 42nd Street bid and maybe like the East Flatbush bid aren't necessarily taking in the same sort of fees from their, um, from their businesses. So are you looking at that? Are you looking at some of the demographics in the neighborhoods and some of the socioeconomic influences on the bids and trying to really uplift those communities that uh, you know, quite honestly, in uh, mostly these communities of color, the MWBEs and some of your own goals. How are you looking to uplift some of the neighborhoods that aren't necessarily bringing in as much money as Union Square or Gramercy? Mm -hmm. 
Sure. So one, so we actually use the word assessment. I think um, we prefer that, and I think that's sort of uh, the way that. Um, the money is collected is actually assessed against property owners, right? So t um, technically, um, you know, if a, bi if a business, a small business is paying into the bid, it is really kind of between them and their landlord via their lease on whether they're paying that fee. But otherwise, it is the property owners who are actually legally responsible for paying that assessment. Um, and the second thing I would say, and sort of it plays very importantly into sort of the nature of bids and their assessment formulas is um, a lot of times, the, I mean, as you will kind of clearly see, the bids that have the largest budget budgets tend to be about the density of the area um, because in, all, in central business districts and areas that have office, upper floor offices, they, can as they are assessing those properties as well. So I think it's true you will see um, in, in less dense parts of the city um, more retail focused bids or even industrial bids. Um, their assessments are based, you know, really on sort of a single level, generally maybe two levels of, of commercial use. Um, so in those cases, if we're, what, what our agency is doing, we, we certainly, um, as I touched on, provide a lot of sort of capacity building supports for the organization. Um, certainly those under a certain budget, I mean, all bids are able to receive certain types of support. I think it does tend to be that those under generally under 500,000 or under a million dollars tend to um, take use of those services more than the others. Um, and then when, and then if, um, if it is, the bid is located in a low to moderate income neighborhood as defined by this, uh, the census, uh, we have a whole sort of additional pot of money or community development block grant money that we do uh, make available for both sort of direct grants to the bid as well as um, sort of capacity building grants where we're actually giving the grant to a third party citywide entity that provides t direct technical assistance to the bid. I just have one, one last question, uh, Mr. Chair, if you'll indulge me. Um, this is actually a, a question from, I guess, one of the bids. So the bids in all of the city's plaza partners, they've, they said they've reached an impasse on new <coughs> agreements for the maintenance and programming of the city's public plazas. What are you doing to elevate the discussion and ensure that the issues are resolved? Um, sure, we are happy. I, I touched on it quickly in my testimony, but we are um, we work quite closely with the DOT's Plaza program. Um, they have a team at DOT, their public space team. I, I think they're referred to, and we um, we have been working with them quite honestly f for years um, via the working group um, um, that the Bid Association created. So we have we've had a seat at those tables more recently. Um, as I know, negotiations over the concession um, agreement have become more urgent, given that I think some are, are going to be uh, expiring soon. We have, we, have, we have gotten very involved and helped to elevate this issue, not only within um, you know, sort of the law department, which obviously has a, a big role to play here, um, but also with, it, with City Hall and with DOT to ensure that you know, we're all working and that they're essentially to ensure that those working um, sort of from the legal perspective are kind of understanding the programmatic challenges that the bids are seeing on the ground. And so um, I know, I mean, I'm sure some of the bids can speak to this, but we have facilitated some conversation recently at City Hall with Law Department. Those conversations are continuing as far as I know, and we will certainly continue to stay engaged. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the bids in my district who are here today. Thank you, Councilwoman. So I think you understand, you realize how I embrace bids and how I really see their importance in the survival of our commercial corridors and their, their help in assisting those small businesses keep their doors open. Uh, the concern that their budget and a large portion of their budget is going to city services, in particular sanitation and security. Um, which that part of the, and the 2017 report shows a combined 40% of their budgets are going into those two areas. And it's just concerning that 32% of their budget is going to marketing, beautification, and capital improvements. If we're going to help these bids, better serve the needs of their small businesses and their commercial corridors. 
what creative ways can we come up with where they start focusing their revenue and their limited resources into things that would help better the co consumer attractiveness and base to add to their business models to continue to let these co corridors thrive? Well, um, as far as, uh, you know, there's probably a lot of <laughs> creative ideas and opportunities out there, and I guess in this situation, so for ex just as an example, in the, like in the Bid Trends Report, when we collect that data, which is some of the data you're citing on, the on you know, dollars going to different program areas, we are also pulling anecdotes and best practices and interesting things that bids have done so that they can not only learn from each other and potentially adapt and look at those, but even the cost numbers you cite, um, I think you know, there is an opportunity for bids to use this and look at how much they are spending as an individual bid compared to other bids in their sort of budget bracket and their similar geographies. So they can have a sense of whether maybe they should be pursuing the ideas you're, you're talking about, essentially looking at where they could either uh, redirect, cost cut, modify the number of days they have service, the hours they have service. It's, it's, it's really, I guess in, in this situation, it's not, um, we're providing sort of the data for them to, to make use of, um, but we ultimately are looking to the community, you know, the locally governed board to make that decision on whether they want to spend, you know, all of their budget on something or less than budget. As long as they're meeting the district plan and their contract with us, we're okay with sort of their local call on, on how much and where to direct their, their budget. I don't think it's by choice. I think it's by necessity that they're spending this amount of money on those two city services. Um, you yourself were a bid director. Mm -hmm. What was the, what allocation of your budget did you use to those two city services as a, which was supposed mm. to supplement? Correct. Well, um, I couldn't tell you the exact breakdown anymore, but I could tell you from what I recall, um, the bid I ran, um, and for the benefit of, of the rest of the committee, um, the Myrtle Avenue Brooklyn bid um, that I ran, I think from 2004 to 2014 or something like that. Um, and so when that bid was started, it was a $250,000 bid. Um, we spent the board decided to spend zero of the budget on on security, uh, at least direct security. We certainly put some of my time and the staff's time toward liaising with the NYPD and the, you know their uh, community affairs officers, and so we certainly um, held regular meetings with them and spent time. We spent time thinking about sort of security cameras, that kind of thing, but we didn't pay for direct contracted security. Um, I don't remember how much we paid for sanitation at the time, but I'm, um, it was that was an important piece. We did um, feel that supplementary sanitation, which at the time we ensured was we wanted seven days a week. They wanted it in the morning. They wanted it when school kids got out. They wanted it when people were going to restaurants in the evening. You know, we looked and strategized and ensured that we were getting the best bang for our buck for what they wanted to see. We always looked for cost-saving methods, and we also, I should say, which is not to say that this is always um, effective immediately, but we thought a lot about waste prevention and education and how and we actually worked with schools in the early days and worked with Pratt Institute and others on thinking about you know, messaging around reducing garbage so the sidewalks weren't as dirty as they had been historically. So, I mean, even when you're paying, in my view, even when you're paying for daily sanitation supplementary services, it doesn't mean that you, you, know, you don't want the business owners and the residents and the stakeholders in that community to think about Right, why we are having to spend this money on that and how, and so can you at a parallel track start pushing and, and educating people to, to do better? Based on the numbers that I have, um, the last year that you were there, 2020 to the full year, you spent more than a quarter of your budget on security and sanitation. Um, and I'm sure you did it because there was a real need for it, mm -hmm. but it took away from your abilities to enhance other areas to improve your commercial district. And since 2013, those numbers have steadily gone up for all bids when it comes to those two categories. So just, just making a quick analysis, I would imagine your 25% in 2013 would be equivalent to closer to the 40% that we have today that is the norm, unless you have something else like
You want to comment on that? Oh, I was just trying to see if, uh, yeah, verifying uh, on, on sort of changes. I, again, I, I mean, I guess I would just say, like, it's whether 25% I mean, it's, I guess you, one could debate whether that is sort of the right amount to be spent, but that's, again, we don't make that call. I think the board, if they felt like things that the district was getting cleaner and they wanted to spend less or altered or redirected towards holiday, I mean, I know for an example since, <laughs> and I think Meredith would, uh, has nudged me about this since I left, um, I think the board has preferred to spend more on holiday lights than I, you know, than they did when I was there, and that was a real desire and need, and so they put more of their assessment dollars to it. They've gone out and fundraised for it. I mean, I think, look, the nature of the, of the beast is sort of local control, and so therefore, if a board wants to do it, I understand what you're saying, that, I mean, there are, there are times that they, you know, you always wish you could have more resources to do everything you wanted to do, but there is a certain aspect of the work that is about being, you know, quick, nimble, efficient, and ensuring that you are, you know, doing what you can for the district with the assessment dollars that the district can afford. And therefore, I think in the cases where we have seen spending increase, I don't, I mean, I don't think we've seen anything in our view that seems sort of like out of the ordinary that doesn't, um, in some cases, um, changes to living wage and cost, and, and cost of living and other things have also um, come into play when, when where the bids have, have spent more. We've spoken many a times, and we both understand the importance of our commercial corridors. And these are about ways that we can come up. The importance of this hearing is so we can figure out how to improve the way biz bids are operating, so they can focus on expanding and growing and helping the businesses that they're there to fight for. It's yep. their tax dollars that are being used to supplement city services. And whether it be 40% or 25% of their budget, their tax dollars that they're paying for, that are put into those two categories and not other categories that would improve the amount of frequent, of consumer frequency to that area. I think that's where the dialogue should be. And if it means increased security presence where we have an NYPD officer there that is um, would enhance the security for a commercial corridor, their presence in itself, where to alleviate that line item in their budget so they can focus on marketing and events and other things that would bring in more cons customers and consumers. I think that's the, what we would hope to strive for. I understand that. And I, yes, and I, and, I, and I think that is exactly what does happen in many cases. I think, and again, I, it's very, you know, I went on a caution that like pulling this data together speaks to the pro bid program as a whole, but, it, but I'm, I'm sure each and every bid will tell a potentially different story around how they may challenge that particular, address that particular challenge. So, and I, did, I think there are cases where bids have been successful in getting a beat cop or in getting uh, allocation from a city council member for additional sanitation through the, the cleanup initiative or, you know, whatever it may be. So, I, I mean, to a certain extent, that really is, um, you know, uh, I, I do think there are sort of unique opportunities for each bid, depending on the situation, to, to sort of tackle that challenge and, 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 and think about creative ways where they can redirect assessment dollars if necessary. I hope we'll continue that dialogue. Uh, it is a probably vital to their survival and the frustration of those businesses that aren't seeing the increase in business flow and traffic flow because their dollars are being diverted to other areas that are important but should not yeah. be coming out of their particular budget is my concern. I believe you share the same sentiment. Yeah, be happy to talk more about it. Do you have any other questions? I want to thank you for your testimony. We have a list of others that want to testify and be heard. And I'm hopeful that you'll actually stick around to we, hear. We most definitely uh, are. Roxanne and I will be here. Excellent. Thank you. For our second panel, uh, we have the New York City Bid Association, Southern Boulevard, Westchester Square, Third Avenue, and Fordham Road.
think you'll all agree with me that we should let um, the ladies go first. Could you please introduce yourself and um, who you represent? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Meredith Phillips Almeida, co-chair of the New York City Bid Association. Andrea Mayhe, bid manager, Southern Boulevard. Michael Brady, executive director of the Third Avenue Business Improvement District. Can we begin with you, Marilyn? Sure. Chair Joan, I am grateful for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Meredith Phillips Almeida, and I am the executive director of the Myrtle Avenue Brooklyn Partnership, which manages the Myrtle Avenue bid in Fort Greene and Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. And I'm also the co-chair of the New York City Bid Association. The Bid Association represents the 75 bids across all five boroughs. New York City has one of the largest and most comprehensive bid initiatives in the country. Together, our members provide their communities with over $140 million in supplemental services annually, primarily through private assessment funds paid by property owners in the districts. Bids represent neighborhoods in all five boroughs, and our business stakeholders are as diverse as the city itself, ranging from small family-run bodegas to large department stores to intimate restaurants to airport storage facilities and everything in between. And it's this reach that allows the Bid Association to serve as an effective advocate for the city's small businesses and for our commercial districts. All bids are very different in terms of neighborhood context, budget, and their district priorities. Through the Bid Association's working groups, which bring together bids from across the city around common issues, we have been able to shape policies and processes that impact all of our neighborhoods for the better. So these working groups are established to find solutions that cut across the jurisdiction of multiple agencies like DDC, like DOT, NYPD, DSNY, SAPO, and on and on and on. Solving problems among multiple agency stakeholders is extremely difficult and complex and we appreciate the chairman's and this committee's recognition of the complex problems facing commercial districts. We are already committing our own significant resources to addressing them, but we need the city overall to work with us, partner with us, and commit additional agency resources to address the challenges in our corridors and in the current small business climate. We know that the bids as local stakeholders are willing to pitch in and ensure a successful endeavor as partners to the city in these agencies, but we need agencies to meet us halfway. Our collective advocacy efforts have been most important in supporting our members with smaller budgets and fewer personnel resources who often feel especially disconnected from the cu crucial information streams from agencies. And my colleagues who are testifying later will elaborate on specific challenges with specific uh, agencies in their districts. So notwithstanding the need for additional resources, there are examples of success, and I'd like to share a few. One significant accomplishment I wanna mention, a direct result of our collaborative partnership with SBS is the universal model contract. Until last year, if you can believe it, every single bid had a different contract with the city of New York. The language was different, the requirements were different, the terms were different. Often this was, again, particularly burdensome for the smallest bids. Uh, no, there are about 30 bids with assessments under $350,000 and about 20 bids with two or fewer staff members. So a large majority of the bids are, are on the smaller side. The Bid Association created a working group and worked directly with SBS as partners and ultimately the law department. And today we have a universal model contract with uniform procurement procedures that governs every bid's contractual relationship with the city. So an example of a great success through there. To speak further to our relationship specifically with SBS, the Bid Association is encouraged by efforts to further SBS advocacy on an agency level on behalf of bids. We are currently working closely with SBS on a number of initiatives, Blaze mentioned a few, to design to improve our relationship both with SBS and other city agencies, and we look forward to continuing that important work. We do think that SBS has an important role to play in facilitating improved communication with city agencies to ensure bids are able to be responsive to our communities. And like I said, we're encouraged with the, what we've been doing directly with SBS to move that forward. We appreciate the council's recognition and support in helping to elevate bids as partners to agencies in strengthening our neighborhood commercial corridors. And I would just, the one word I want to emphasize there is partners. We need agencies to see bids as partners because, in fact, we are contractual partners to the city of New York. 
Thank you for that. Good afternoon, Chair Jonai, Council Members Ayala, Levin, Perkins, and Rivera. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Andrea Mehi, the bid manager for the Southern Boulevard Business Improvement District, which is located in the South Bronx. The Southern Boulevard Business Improvement District was established in 2007 and promotes the growth, vitality, and visibility of the premier shopping destination in the Hunts Point section of the South Bronx. Organizational programs include real estate advisory and real retail services, sanitation and security departments that augment the city's own services, small business development services, streetscape and open space improvements, horticulture installations, robust public programming, event planning, and visitor services. As you know, business improvement districts are partners, as Meredith stated, of the City of New York. And at the very heart of what we do is maintaining the stability and growth of small businesses and commercial districts. Southern Boulevard is home to mom and pop shops and some emerging large franchises. Today I want to focus on two very specific areas of the City of New York. At the very heart of what we do is maintaining the stability and growth of small businesses and commercial districts. Southern Boulevard is home to mom and pop shops um, and some emerging large franchises. That's my space, excuse me. The two areas that I want to focus on are the small business vacancies and the New York City property tax structure. Unlike other counterparts in the Bronx, Southern Boulevard has a relatively high vacancy rate. As we take a deep dive into the reason for these vacancies, many small businesses state that the property tax passed through is just too high and is becoming overburdensome. At the same time, the city is not equitably deploying tax dollars derived from property tax, so the businesses that are paying in are not getting equitable baseline services from the city. This is specifically the case in the areas of homelessness, substance abuse, and sanitation. When we look at property taxes, we must be aware of the burden this imposes on small businesses. Not every landlord is greedy. In Southern Boulevard, many of the landlords are small businesses themselves and deserve the support, not the demonization of city government. And then the other area is illegal vending. Some of my counterparts in the Bronx and outer boroughs may not be politically, may be more politically correct in stating that uh, vendors add to the lifeblood of our sidewalks and local economies. This may be the case in highly trafficked areas, but in my district, these vendors pose a direct threat to brick and mortar mom and pop shops. The vendors do not share in the financial burden by shouldering taxes, nor do they support the basic bid services that pick up their leftover garbage or public safety, or public safety officers that protect them. This is not equitable and at the heart, an unfair stack against bids that seek to create thriving commercial districts during a time when we are competing against big box stores and on on online retailers. The city must enact legislation that not only fully understands the complexities of vending in New York City, but fairly distributes the financial burdens that such activities bring on mom and pop shops in their districts. It is my hope that we can continue a dialogue that helps small businesses in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a question. What is the vacancy rate uh, in your bid for Southern uh, Boulevard? Uh, approximately 16 to 17 percent, I believe. I'm wondering about that. Have you seen an uptick? Is this a con Yes, and it has been voiced by the board members who are also property owners. Yes, there has been an uptick. There has been. Good afternoon, Chairman Joe Nye. My name is Lisa Soren. I am the Executive Director for the Westchester Square Business Improvement District located in the 13th Council District, which is, belongs to the Chairman. I am here today because it is important for this committee to hear the concerns being echoed across our commercial corridors. In a nutshell, I believe that the criticism of the current system should not focus on the system itself 
but instead on the delivery of the benefits that the system is supposed to provide. Outside forces complicate business life. In a city like New York, those forces are myriad and sundry, and in most cases, the bureaucracy of siloed agencies work against each other in achieving the stated goals of making New York the greatest city in which to live, grow, and achieve. Business improvement districts provide a business plan for all businesses within its district. A bid identifies the needs of the local businesses and then speaks with the one big voice to advance these needs. One of the most important ways in which this is achieved is the conduit that a bid provides between the individual businesses and city agencies. In the past years, SBS coordinated connections between these agencies and bids. Recently, that service has been diminished to the point where it is largely now non-existent. Therein lies the problem, the delivery of support through the bids and to our businesses. Properly representing the business needs of thousands of property owners and merchants requires a bid to work efficiently, effectively with all government agencies impacting our corridors. And I thank the Bid Association who's a big support in where these, these services may be lacking. A recent example of this big problem can be seen in the city's newest business improvement district in Morris Park. Although the Morris Park bid has been established by local law, and although property owners have been assessed by finance for their investment in the bid, to this day, the bid is not allowed to function due to a bottleneck at the law department, which has signed the signing of the new bids contract with the city. A contract that was developed by the bid association, SBS, and that same law department. It is currently in place with almost every bid in New York. This is not a systematic problem, it is a delivery problem. Please elaborate a little bit more on that bottleneck. As of right now, Morris Park has been signed into law approximately about five months. The contract is still sitting with the law department, being reviewed for the last almost five weeks. And there's no other follow-up to wait? Unfortunately, first? it's pending. Um, with all due respect, the law department seems to be a black hole that I can't seem to reach. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Jonai. Michael Brady, Executive Director of the Third Avenue Business Improvement District located in the South Bronx. I apologize in advance, my remarks go longer than three minutes. The Third Avenue Business Improvement District is the Bronx's oldest bid has approximately 200 member businesses slated to grow to 800 by 2019 and greets over 200,000 visitors daily. In addition to leading the Third Avenue bid, my organization currently manages the Southern Boulevard Business Improvement District to our east and the Bruckner Boulevard Commercial Corridor to our south. Collectively, these areas represent the majority of the South Bronx with over 700 member businesses slated to grow to 1,500 member businesses by 2019. Some are locally owned mom and, and pops, Others are larger franchises, a healthy mix of destination and convenience retailers and service providers. Our organizations have had great impact on ensuring that businesses, particularly those in the outer boroughs, can exist and thrive in the rapidly changing economic landscape that is New York City. As you know, business improvement districts are legislated partners of the city of New York. Funded and self-sustained by contributions in the form of a special assessment on property owners, business improvement districts have management agreements with the City of New York and are some of the earliest examples of public and private partnerships. At the very heart of what we do is maintaining the stability and growth of small businesses and commercial districts. In 2017, over $147 million in services were provided by New York City's bid network of 75 bids across all five boroughs assisting over 93,000 small and micro businesses. I'm here today, as I was in February and the subsequent hearings thereafter, because New York City has still failed its small, emerging, and micro business communities. We as a city have not created an environment whereby micro businesses can grow, nor whereby businesses want to stay, nor have we provided an adequate definition of those <coughs> businesses caught in between. I make the distinction between small, emerging, and micro businesses because so many shops and services offered in my district and throughout New York City rarely exceed or even come close to the SBA classification for small businesses. 
I want to also clarify testimony that I delivered in February. Over the past eight months, I have realized that the target of my frustration, predominantly aimed at the New York City Department of Small Business Services, was misguided. The agency employing over 300 hardworking public servants is not to blame for the lack of clarity and support for New York City's small business community. Rather, the city with a big C and the current administration are to blame. No agency is perfect and uh, by any means, and it means a great deal when an agency listens and acts when confronted with issues that affect the community. New York City SBS has listened to the concerns voiced in February, and as evidenced by the testimony of Deputy Commissioner Backer, have made strides to remedy and modify service programs to more adequately address, address the on-the-ground needs of the small business community. I am personally grateful. In that process, I have realized that the administration needs to empower SBS so that the agency may enforce and tackle some of the most dire issues affecting commercial districts and hold accountable other agencies that are simply not doing their jobs effectively. In doing so, the city could publicly strengthen their commitment to being a partner, as Meredith said, to business improvement districts and elevate bids to a level by which we are contractually bound. In an era where speculation, gentrification, displacement, and the existence of mom and pops are consistently threatened, partnerships with the city of New York need to be strengthened. Positions, particularly in the area of supporting small businesses, need to be publicly enhanced, and special care needs to be given to small businesses that are between five and 10 years old. As I mentioned earlier, bids are partners of New York City. Unfortunately, this partnership falls flat with the current administration. In many instances, the office of the mayor has legislatively dodged or sabotaged business improvement districts for the sake of political gain. Some examples include members of the administration ignoring the pleas of bids to have more resources to combat the growing opioid epidemic, homelessness, pedestrian safety, and aging corridor infrastructure. This is compounded by members of the, of the administration touting that business improvement districts are agents of gentrification. I know that many individuals, organizations, and groups have strong opinions on the role of business improvement districts. Some welcome them as a method to have property owners pay an additional assessment to insist in maintaining the commercial corridor in communities, others linking bids with gentrification movements. I traditionally don't weigh in on either side of the argument because the Bronx and most of our outer boroughs represent a very different model to typical bids. You see, in my district, we don't have the luxury of completing major capital projects, traveling abroad to scout out the latest trends in bus shelter development or elaborate streetscape programs, largely because our programs are making up for over five decades of community disinvestment. Our $450,000 budget is spread over supplemental sanitation, accounting for a third of our budget, security services, staffing, and public programs. Many bids in historically under-resourced communities are doing similar work. Our communities never had a real seat at the table and have slowly developed a bid framework that works for us and works for the communities that we serve. A framework that protects our communities, and by communities, I mean all members. Our businesses, property owners, residents, homeless, developers, and individuals suffering from mental illness and substance abuse. All are part of our community fabric, and all are represented in the conversation. The administration needs to clarify its support of business improvement districts and expend political capital to send a very clear message regarding the important work of business improvement districts and our support of the inner clock of New York City. Quite simply, during a time when the mayor is more focused on political gains and not the day-to-day -day management of the city of New York, bids must assume the role of city managers in our commercial districts. Rhetoric aside, there are specific actions that the city of New York can implement to support small businesses and our commercial districts. Trash and commercial waste. Number one, legislate and fund seven-day waste pickup by the Department of Sanitation for all commercial districts. On average, the Third Avenue bid gathers about 125 bags of waste daily, and we're on a three-day-a-week pickup schedule. I'm sure you can see there's a problem with that. Number two, ensure that rat-proof rat waste receptacles are adequately distributed throughout the city of New York. My district qualifies for 90 and only has 16. The 16 that were provided were only provided after Council Member Salamanca provided the funding. There was no movement on the part of the City Hall to address this. Three, take a deep dive and really examine the unintended consequences of the commercial waste zoning legislation. Politics aside, there must be a middle ground on this legislation that protects small businesses and balances environmental justice concerns. Four, provide greater transparency and oversight of borough-based operations from the central office of DSNY onto opioid and substance misuse. 
The city must do more to get individuals suffering from opioid and substance addiction into care and off the streets. Currently, if an individual is overdosing or high they, and they refuse care from NYPD or an EMT, there is no recourse. I understand the need to address substance misuse with human dignity and care. In fact, my organization in partnership with Acacia Network and Councilmember Salamanca co-chair the Bronx Opioid Task Force, which, syst which systemically addresses the issue. However, the ability of service providers, public safety and health official officials have been neutered by policies and legislation. This needs to be remedied. Two, evaluate, coordinate, and evenly apply fair share to substance misuse services in districts and prevent an oversaturation of those services. In my district alone, we have 27 substance service providers in a two block radius. This is not to say that those providers are not necessary or do not provide quality services. Rather, it's to underscore that the issue of oversaturation exists and highlights the lack of equity when these, services, when these service entities are cited. Of course, these services want to be in the heart of the epidemic. Dollars are attached to the number of people you serve. However, we as a city are not doing enough to bring those numbers down, nor is there a commitment from the service providers that their vision, their mission, should be to reduce the use of substances, thereby reducing their billable client rate over time. New York City infrastructure programs. We have an aging infrastructure program that is ho holding on by a thread. At the same time, we have small, a small business community that is also holding on by a thread. When our city embarks on infrastructure or seeks to develop open space, we must do it quickly and on budget, while also having built into the budget compensation for small businesses that the infrastructure work is disrupting. In my district, five small businesses have closed on a track of Third Avenue between 149th and 148th Streets. This is due largely to a city project that has gone on for 10 years and is still not complete. There is no legitimate recourse for these businesses. Storefront vac vacancies. Thankfully, the Third Avenue bid is blessed with a relatively low vacancy rate of 5%. However, vacancies continue to plague our city. I understand that the current narrative is that this is caused by greedy landlords. This is not always the case. Often vacancies are the result of a tenant holding onto a lease and moving out, litigation, structural repairs, or in some cases because the prospective tenant is not able to shoulder the share of the property tax burden or compete with small businesses and street vendors in the district. I want to make an unpopular statement. Property owners or developers are not often wealthy. I know many people think that they are, but if you were to account for a mortgage or multiple mortgages, taxes, especially on properties with vacancies, legal fees, rent delinquencies, building maintenance and fines, partnership payouts, broker fees, concessions, and general costs of marketing and doing businesses, it is very rare that an outer borough property owner is making money hand over fist, especially in outer borough markets where micro businesses outnumber large credit rated retail stores. This is not a woe is me for the property owners, but a legitimate fact. Protests and demonizing property owners must stop so that a legitimate business dialogue can occur. As a city, it is time for us to take on land scarcity, the changing retail market and abusive tax structures, and create a more equitable forum for business creation and development. This does not mean that the city bears the burden alone. We must take on predatory leasing and antiquated strategies that do more harm in our neighborhoods than good. We must build the capacity of mom and pop businesses so that they too can compete on the e, on the e commerce platforms. We must combat long-held strategies like commercial warehousing or the process in which land landlords hold on to property without renting it out in the hopes of its a rental value may, may rise. This leaves many of our older commercial districts with inactive, underutilized upper floor spaces. Currently, no penalty exists for property owners who neglect vacant properties or intentionally leave space vacant. In order to create, uh, in order to create commercial affordability in well-planned and programmed commercial districts, the city must ensure that landlords who warehouse properties are held accountable, whether through significant fines or increased taxation on properties left unleased for over a year. However, I want to track, I want to tread carefully that this must be guided by accurate data and an understanding of why properties are vacant. Currently, no legitimate data set exists for the entire city nor are appropriate agencies speaking to each other to fully understand the reason for the vacancy. Commercial rent stabilization. While I realize there is a push for commercial rent stabilization, I do not think it is wise, nor would it have the effect proponents of the initiative would intend. Instead, I would take a deep dive into tax and finance and update systems and procedures for accurate tax data. Reduce commercial taxes by at least 2% with a mandated reduction in a tenant pass through pay on those payments. It is my hope that the newly created tax commission is not a sham 
and makes real recommendations to this council on how our antiquated tax structure should be reformed. The Small Business Survival Act, which I know is recently receiving a hearing. The council must do more than just a grandstanding hearing in this legislation. There is some real value to this legislation. However, as many of the original writers of the legislation will tell you, there are also some serious flaws and revisions that need to be addressed. It is my sincere hope that this council will address those flaws before passing an unconstitutional bill for the sake of public relations. This does not benefit anyone and is essentially pimping out our small business community to build political support. Non-compliant vendors. The Third Avenue Business Improvement District urges this council to take significant and meaningful measures to ensure that ending any vending bill that is considered before this council is done in a thoughtful public manner that embraces evidence-based research while also accounting for unintended consequences related to the passage of any vending bill. We would also urge the council to have a corporation council clarify and make a determination on clauses in bid contracts that give bids jur jurisdiction over sidewalks. As you may be aware, the Bronx's commercial districts are experiencing a rebirth. With this growth comes new opportunity to activate vacant spaces, update infrastructure, and ensure that sidewalks are safe and well-programmed for residents and shoppers, while also maintaining a vibrant, regulated, and safe street life for vendors. Street vendors add, add, uh, add to the essence of the communities across the city and provide a platform for local economies. This is a fact that no one will debate except for maybe Andrea. Uh, you, you as well as the majority of the council members have expressed concern for entrepreneurs who run small businesses, the lifebloods of our district and our city, and the backbone of our communities. This administration has publicly noted that the thoroughly irrational regulatory system for street vendors needs to be rationalized because current conditions on city sidewalks are, quote, mayhem. We ensure we encourage you to use this time as an opportunity to transform a broken and obsolete system into a more comprehensive and sustainable marketplace for all. The issue deserves careful consideration and not rushed judgment. While vendors add to the lifeblood of our economies and local flavor, the prior legislation introduced to the prior council will hurt our communities and the vending economy le the legislation seeks to, seeks to protect. There should be a very real evaluation of the number of vendors in New York City and a concerted plan to create sidewalk space for vendors through an organized system, enforcement of New York City vending re regulation, and a shared assessment fee and property tax structure imposed on street vendors working in business improvement districts. While the above points do not illustrate the entirety of the challenges New York City has self-imposed, they do represent strategic areas for improvement. If the mayor of the city of New York is serious about creating the fairest big city in America, then we must start by ensuring our small businesses have an opportunity fairly to fairly compete in the New York City marketplace. It is my hope that this brief conversation today, although not so brief, uh, can continue a dialogue that changes the course of business development in New York City. If we can accomplish even one or two of these goals, we will be in a far better place than we are today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Michael. That was just two minutes on the dot. <laughs> Perfect, I thought so. <laughs> Acknowledge that you often refer to micro businesses, um, which was an important segment of mine. I'm introducing a piece of legislation which is going to eventually define a micro business as a mom and pop, and then perhaps when we do so, we can offer the additional services and help that they need to succeed and stay afloat. So I want to thank you all. But you did mention, uh, you've mentioned quite a bit. Um, I'm surprised that your vacancy is only 5%. One of the reasons why our vacancies are so low, particularly on the ground floor, is a lot of our merchants actually own their buildings. Um, so it, it makes the math work. Um, for example, the building where our office is housed, the property owner owns all of the businesses on the ground floor, um, and they the math just pencils out a bit more. However, with the recent increase in property taxes, uh, that's not the case. Um, you take a property that was originally paying roughly $250,000 a year in property tax, and now they're paying about $400,000 a year. We have much to do. We um, do. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, your service pickup. In this budget, we allocated additional funding for more frequent pickup of trash cans. You are not a recipient of that benefit? Not yet. We're working on it with um, SBS to have a meeting with sanitation to really um, try to figure out the sanitation needs of the Bronx's busiest commercial corridor, and it's something that's been neglected for quite some time. I'll look into that for you, Michael, and I'll speak to Salamanca, but he should have benefited from the, I think it was $3.5 million that was allocated 
uh, to certain commercial corridors for more frequent pickup. I would even be happy instead of three to have five. Uh, you know, we'll take baby steps right now. Um, Thank you. Thank you. For the next panel, NYC in Brooklyn. Just go ahead. Flatiron Partnership, 125th Street bid, Lincoln Square. So we're going to go south to north. <laughs> You're the oldest. <laughs> you okay with me going first? Yeah. Sorry, no particular order, but I'm a big fan of starting with the teenager at the table. Oh. The teenager at the table? Well, you heard what I said, I guess. <laughs> How do I turn, is this, um, am I on? Yes, I'm on. Um, hi, my name is Monica Blum. I'm the president of the Lincoln Square Business Improvement District. I serve on the board of the Bid Association and I co-chair the Bid Association's Mentoring and Outreach Committee. Thank you, uh, Chairman Joni and members of the committee um, for this opportunity to testify today. I've been president of the Lincoln Square Bid for 21 years. I'm the founding president. And when I started in this position, I had to create a nonprofit organization from scratch, a startup. I relied on the knowledge and assistance of fellow bid directors and the Department of Small Business Services to help me get our organization up and running and programs started. Then in 1996, there were 39 bids. Tonight, today, as you've heard, there are 75, and in many ways, new bids, and some of us as well, still rely on the extensive network of colleagues and Department of Small Business Services to learn the ropes. Today, the New York City Bid Association is a formal entity with a board, working groups, and several committees, including the Mentoring Committee, which, as I said, I co-chair with my colleague, Matt Bauer, from Madison Avenue. The Mentoring and Outreach Committee includes bid directors from small bids, large bids with representation from all five boroughs. Our goal is to help new bids and new bid directors avoid reinventing the wheel. As you know, bids are unique nonprofits incorporated in the state of New York and are governed by a board of directors with fiduciary responsibility. Our boards are required by law to include property owners, commercial tenants, residential tenants, and representative of each of the following, the mayor, the controller, the borough president, the city council. We each have contracts with the city of New York. Our relationships with the city are key to our success. What distinguishes New York City's 75 business improvement districts is that each of our programs is different and reflects the specific needs and wishes of our business communities and the neighborhoods we serve. Our programs include sanitation, area maintenance, public safety, joint marketing, holiday promotions, street, streetscape and beautification, creative event programming, graffiti removal, restoration of retail facades, and many projects that support neighborhood organizations and engage youth and older adults. Bids must comply with a whole host of city and state mandates, including minimum wage laws, paid sick leave, paid family leave, sexual harassment, et cetera. We must put procedures in place, get them adopted by our boards. If we provide services, we must identify providers and go out to bid. We work closely with our government partners to leverage government support and funding for projects that improve the quality of life for our neighborhoods, its businesses, employees, property owners, residents, and visitors. The Bid Association has worked closely with SBS on a number of initiatives designed to our, improve our relationship with SBS and city agencies. SBS has also been a pioneer in identifying and opening up avenues of funding for smaller bids, including Avenue NYC and the Neighborhood 360 Fellows Program, which enables small bids to expand their capacity and strengthen commercial corridors with talented people interested in working in the bid world. 
SBS helps coordinate Small Business Saturday and provides a roundtable to help bids begin planning for this important retail initiative. Capacity building for small bids has been a key objective of SBS and the New York City Bid Association. We recognize that smaller bids just don't have the staff to do what some of the larger bids do. So just complying with the all new mandates is time consuming and takes staff away from programming. We hope that in the coming year, SBS will expand its training and roundtable sessions to cover such things as sexual harassment training, fiscal management, nonprofit management, Uniform database, etc. I, over the years, have attended many of these and have found them extremely helpful. We think that SBS could also facilitate, and I know others have spoken about this, improved communication with city agencies to ensure that bids are able to be responsive to our stakeholders. There have always been public private partnerships with communities taking responsibility for improving the quality of life in their own neighborhoods. Bids are one form of creative public-private partnership that harnesses the resources, ingenuity, energy, and commitment from the business community. In order for New York to continue to thrive and flourish, we all need to do our part in sustaining and supporting New York's vibrant economic revitalization. Thank you.
A second allocation for the council member persons allowed us to build on the recommendations from the first study. We determined it was important to understand the quantity, type, and origin of trash beyond landfill at this point, given that city average statistics do not characterize our problem. And if the problem is not properly characterized, it will be hard to identify effective means by which to solve it. We continued our partnership with Columbia University <coughs> and surveyed 126 streets as well as five blocks along 116th Street and five blocks along 135th Street. Stopping trash where it starts in Harlem is our approach, and we are considered to a clean and healthier Harlem. This public-private partnership <coughs> approach showcased a much more proactive and inclusive planning effort in a targeted area on an ongoing basis than the city engages in today. Recommendations implement. Our first report yielded 11 key findings and 12 policy recommendations that guided us. We developed our first education awareness campaign called Harlem Just Junk. Yes. We created and circulated literature to businesses and the community outlining sanitation and trash handling regulations. Working with Manhattan Community Boards 9 and 10, we increased the number of community groups involved in cleaning initiatives. We piloted Big Belly Solar Trash Compactors with expressions from Harlem artists and placed them on two intersections in the district. We advocate for the New York City Department of Sanitation to increase pickup frequency along the 125th Street route. We advocate for city government to create street vending zones within the Beard Carter and trash disposal regulate regulations for vendors working in these zones. Summarizing, discretionary funding allowed the 125th Street bid to increase hours of cleaning service, conduct research and data collection, create community partnerships and bring the community together, launch clean campaigns and online competition, and educate the community on the need to get involved with keeping their neighborhood healthier and cleaner. We draw one major conclusion. The trash problems we are experiencing will not be solved with one organization. It requires the community, government, academia, and health agencies and providing providers working in tandem toward the goal of making their neighborhoods cleaner and healthier. BIDs are the perfect organizations to bring these entities together. But we also are very clear, none of this would have been possible for us without the help from the city council providing the funding and New York City Department of Small Business Services facilitating the receipt of the funding and guiding the bid in compliance and effective implementation of the accepted program. I close by giving special thanks to my council member, William Perkins, and I submit this model can be replicated by any bid. Identify the problem, apply for discretionary fundings with your local city council member, create partnerships with your local university, this, the community and city government, collect data, develop policy recommendations from the data, implement policy change, and evaluate the effectiveness of new policies. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. What, what percentage of your budget were you using for sanitation? We use um, about, for sanitation, sanitation and public safety combined is about 50%. 50? The two combined, sanitation and public safety, yes. And the reason for that, I'd like to say, is uh, our owners and our board feel that without clean and safe, nothing else matters. Thank you. And what is your percentage of vacancy between? My vacancy, I give two rates. My vacancy total is 8%, but vacancy, vacancy and available, so vacancy and available is about 4%. Because we're going through a growth and there are properties that are vacant, up for sale, people trying to decide what they're going to do. So they're vacant but not available. We also have businesses who left but still pay the rent. So we have vacant, but they're not available. Thank you. And the vacancy rate for Lincoln Square? Lincoln Square. It's about four and a half, four and a half percent. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Jonai. I'm Jennifer Brown, the Executive Director of the Flatiron 23rd Street Partnership, a bid that was formed in 2006. 
Before I continue, our vacancy rate is 6%. <laughs> Ground floor, upper floor is about 4%, and we spend about 52% of our budget combined on clean and safe. Yep. Our district lies, as you may know, in Midtown South uh, in Manhattan as it, and has experienced tremendous growth and change since it was established. It is inclusive of nearly 22 million square feet of commercial office space, 560 ground floor tenants, more than 4,500 upper floor tenants, and 5,000 residential units. I believe it's fair to say that the bid has had a transformative effect on the neighborhood through a series of programs and initiatives. These include clean and safe, beautification and streetscape, marketing and promotion of the neighborhood's businesses and the district at large, community programming, public space management, and homeless outreach. Every day and through all measures, we act as a steward of the area and as, at, and as an advocate for all stakeholders, including property owners, businesses, residents, cultural institutions, and visitors. In all of our work, we begin with a relationship with SBS. SBS has long been our partner, and I know firsthand that its neighborhood development team is committed to assisting bids and communities. The relationship between our bid and SBS has always been a strong one, with shared respect for each other's work and challenges. This has been the case across administrations, commissioners, and staff. Earlier this summer, in the aftermath of the steam pipe explosion on Fifth Avenue, I found SBS at all levels, from the program staff up to the commissioner himself, to be very helpful partners to us and our business community. Unfortunately, some of the most vexing issues facing our community fall outside of SBS's direct purview. The Flatiron Partnership has dedicated substantial resources to addressing two complex issues, public plaza management and street homelessness. Both of these are critical to our work and to the quality of life in our district, and neither has a simple solution. The Flatiron Partnership has, one of the, has been one of the pioneers in the area of plaza development and maintenance. The unique geometry in the heart of our district at Broadway, Fifth Avenue, and 23rd Street was a key place to create a series of pedestrian plazas, and we have been the city's maintenance partner and program partner from day one. Public pl plazas have been proven to be extremely popular with the public, not only in our neighborhood, but many others around the city, in large part because of the efforts and investments made by bids like ours, yet we continue to struggle with certain aspects of the relationship with the city. Street homelessness, panhandling, and related issues are also a chronic problem in our neighborhood as well as many others. In a recent survey sent to all 75 bids citywide, we confirmed through responses received by more than half of the bids that this is a challenge for many districts. In Flatiron, we ask a question in our annual community survey about the biggest challenge facing the district, and for several years running, this issue has topped the list. In order to help those in need and better understand the problem, we have used our own resources to hire a nonprofit agency to conduct outreach as a supplement to the city's services. About one-third of the respondents to that citywide survey that I mentioned indicated they also contract directly with a service provider to tackle this issue. The challenge that I and many of my colleagues have is not that we don't want to or don't think we should have to allocate resources to help our overall environment and assist those in need, but that it truly is a citywide issue, and the efforts at the local level can only go so far in making a true and lasting impact. We would welcome a more robust response from the city regarding how to address the problems associated with homelessness and panhandling. Chronically homeless, service-resistant individuals often have a very complex set of challenges, including mental health and substance abuse issues, among others, and they need a complex set of solutions. Thank you for <coughs> providing us with this opportunity to testify today. I appreciate uh, this hearing and you uh, and giving us a forum to illustrate how New York City bids are leveraging their unique resources and expertise to address the challenges. We do look forward to continuing to work with you and your committee to create additional tools and solutions to ensure our neighborhood's viability. I want to thank you. and. Uh you're not alone, as you heard from the others that testified, and this is a widespread issue, and I'm looking forward to coming up with creative and permanent solutions to addressing these issues and working alongside of SBS to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone that uh, wants to? Yes. James Ellis from Flatbush.
James, I guess. Yep, we thought you weren't coming. But thank you for joining us. You have my slip? I have your slip. Okay, great. All right. Good afternoon. Greetings, Chairman Jonai and the esteemed members of the New York City Council Committee on Small Business. Uh, my name is James Dean Ellis. I am the Contracted Executive Director of the North Flatbush Business Improvement District in Park Slope, Prospect Heights, Pacific Park, Brooklyn. Our district runs along the Flatbush Avenue artery in Brooklyn from Atlantic Avenue to Grand Army Plaza. On behalf of the over 170 businesses, 200 properties, and countless area residents, I'm here to share with you the important role the North Flatbush Business District has in our community. Allow me to take you back to the New York City blackout of 1977. A hot July evening, the city was facing a severe financial crisis, and the loss of power across New York City brought about a crime wave, leaving buildings and storefronts looted across the five boroughs. North Flatbush Avenue experienced its share of destruction, and in response, a concerned group of neighbors, property owners, and business operators rallied to bring resources to improve the area's conditions. When the city was inundated with these problems, the neighbors responded, concerned stakeholders, in fact, some of these stakeholders or their legacy family members are still involved as board members or business operators, and in some instances, both, continuing the work over 40 years later. They are dedicated, entrenched, and full of neighborhood knowledge that informs the decisions the bid makes to this day. The bid was formed in 1986 and has since stewarded many projects to benefit our neighborhood. In fact, we are in the middle of a $63 million infrastructure and pedestrian safety project that has been in progress for 14 years and harkens back to the original Triangle Parks Better Committee that has since evolved into the bid. North Flatbush is home to unique intersections where the Park Slope Avenues cross Flatbush to form interstitial spaces that until our organization became involved were nothing but deserted and undeveloped traffic islands. Over the years, they have undergone a few incarnations and our current project will further enhance these green street spaces and provide for increased pedestrian safety throughout our corridor. Triangle parks aside, although a very important part of, of and our reason for our existence, we continue to be the voice for Ombudsman 2 and cheerleader and champion of our neighborhood, its businesses, residents, and properties. My colleagues here today who have spoken before me and after me share similar message, missions, day-to-day -day experiences, and fight the good fight to address their area's ever-evolving concerns and micro-issues. While we are fundamentally similar, every place and space has its nuances. These little things we know are what, what, what makes us experts in what we do. While the, continue, con while the city continues to address citywide issues with policy, regulations, and resources, we pound the pavement listening diligently to our constituents, hearing about the trash cans that have gone missing, concerns of counterfeit bills being passed in businesses, and parking issues. Oh, the parking issues. The North Flatbush bid has recently experienced the sweeping hand of this administration's desire to address issues of traffic congestion with the Clear Curbs pilot program, a pilot that in my opinion was ill-conceived and not take a look at the local machinations of traffic and impacts of such restrictive parking regulations and militant enforcement. The bid stood up and expressed concern, not just being a whiny NIMBY, but by speaking with our neighbor businesses, hearing the issues and amplifying these concerns to our community boards, city representatives, and agencies with viable solutions. One voice makes noise, many voice makes ha things happen. Those of us at the bid knew what was right for our district's businesses and consumers because we speak with them regularly, and we kept pressure on to remove these over-restrictive regulations. Success came when the pilot program was discontinued earlier than scheduled and our parking rules reverted back to the original regulations. Bids are not always at odds with city agencies. North Flatbush is working with the Department of Transportation to bring additional horticulture and environmentally valuable trees to the district. Collaborating with the amazing team members at DOT's Urban Design Group and with New York City Council discretionary support, North Flatbush has custom designed and is completing installation of 22 planners on our sidewalks today. Not just any ordinary planners, these planners were des specifically designed to promote additional trees in the district, a district with aging trees and underground limitations due to seven subway lines. And represents, this represents a locally designed solution. The first, rep the first phase also represents an approximate $75,000 investment in beautification. And there are plans for future phases at similar costs. 
New York City's DOT's Urban Design Group was instrumental in stewarding our project through the Public Design Commission and spent countless hours consulting us and advising the bid on necessary parameters and best practices. We look forward to what this project will do for our streetscape and air quality and are grateful for the support of New York City DOT on this. While bids tirelessly work to improve conditions, address issues, and polish and shine our little corner of this great city, it would be impossible without the support and guidance of New York City Small Business Services. As a bid with the, small, the seventh smallest assessment of the 75 bids in New York City, our fiscal resources are limited, and we pride ourselves on doing a lot with a little. SPS and their team consistently support our efforts to improve our governance and our nonprofit compliance with their oversight and by providing valuable workshops and resources to bring back to the district, such as business regulation compliance checklists and practice inspections, and as, I, as a sounding board or jump off for other city engagement. I also want to mention the Coro Neighborhood Leadership Program that I and my staff have both taken part in to increase our leadership skills. And this is where I would like to add that the city can do better. New York City bids individually or with the New York City Bid Association are constantly working with various city agencies, sometimes spending countless emails, phone calls, hours or weeks trying to identify the appropriate personnel that can help us with our specific issue. The city is a big operation with many issues to resolve, but the disconnection between these agencies is frustrating and time consuming. Interagency coordination can be terrible as the agencies act like silos with no consideration for agency overlap or the resulting ramifications. Bids provide a ton of resources and investments across the five boroughs, and it would be amazing if some of our time is not spent researching who to speak with. Thus, I would suggest a better, better intergov community affairs portal for bids to engage that would direct us to the appropriate agency and personnel that could be of assistance as we troubleshoot the issues we may have in an expedient manner. Finally, the value of business improvement districts should be recognized by all city agencies, not just when they need something to share or a program to pass along, or et cetera, but recognized as experts of our community, dedicated representatives fighting for our neighborhood, the voice of our district's businesses, neighbors, and property owners, just like of those of you in city council, like the partner's bids were designed to be. Thank you for your time. Thank you. What is the dollar amount of your uh, budget? Our assessment is $150,000 a year. What percentage of that do you use towards sanitation and security? 41.3. How much? 41.3%. And that's the only sanitation we don't offer security. Vacancy rate? Approximately 12.5%. I want to thank you for your time and your testimony. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for their time and their testimony and for being so patient. I want to Thank SBS for remaining here and hearing all the others testify. Thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>